and welcome to today's lecture on the ancient Aegean. We're traveling to some of the Greek islands today. We're going to study three different geographical locations. We're going to look at a lot of artwork that's made at the Cyclades in the Cycladic Islands. We're going to look at art that's made on the island of Crete, which is going to be called the Minoan art. And we're going to be looking at uh, art that's made in the Greek mainland known as Mycenaean art, especially here at the Fortress of Mycenae. So of course we want to make sure we can identify the three different geographical locations of the ancient Aegean, uh, discuss the visual aspects and possible context of cycladic sculptures, and discuss Minoan society and architecture, and understand the visual aspects of Minoan art, understand the link between culture and architecture of Mycenae, identify important Mycenaean architectural achievements, and discuss the relationship between Minoan and Mycenaean art and culture. So we're gonna start um, in the Cyclades, and we're gonna look at a very important island in the Cycladic group called Delos. Now, actually, the Cyclades are called the Cycladic Islands because they kind of circle around the island of Delos. The island of Delos is sort of toward the center. And at the island of Delos, this is where a lot of various um, temples were used for worshiping various you know, gods and goddesses. Um, so it became really important in the ancient world as a center for some of the earliest cults. Um, and uh, a few years back, I actually was able to travel to the Cycladic Islands and we took a trip to the island of Delos. Now the island of Delos, the entire island is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So nobody actually lives on the island. It's, you know, purely uh, for archaeological and you know, art and historical research. Um, and so this photo was sort of taken as we were coming into um, the port of Delos there. Some of the earliest um, cults are going to be the cults related to um, the worship of the god Dionysus, uh, which, you know, obviously has a lot to do with fertility. Um, and uh, worshiping of um, the god Apollo, the god of the sun, uh, and uh, uh, order. So Dionysus, you know, fertility, you know, uh, you know, drinking wine. Sometimes Dionysus is associated uh, with the idea of um, a little more kind of chaos, right? Um, and Apollo is usually associated with this idea of order. And the, these two ideas, you know, chaos and order, um, are directly related to two of the earliest uh, cults um, and the deities that the ancient Aegeans uh, worshipped. And of course the ancient Aegeans are the earliest Greek uh, people. Um, so it's sort of um, Greek Greece before Greece was famous, if that makes sense. Um, and of course um, at the um, temple dedicated to Apollo, there is this really beautiful processional way that has lots of these um, you know statues of lions that kind of adorn the walkway there um, only a few of the lions remain today some of them are in uh, museums but uh, in situ on site there's only a few there okay psychotic statues very important to understand that uh, these are really known and revered for their simplicity and their uh, overall abstract geometric shapes. So oftentimes you're going to see uh, lots of rectilinear forms, lots of triangular shapes, um, and simplified um, uh, uh, abstracted forms. Now, the um, collectors of cyclotic statues uh, have a real task ahead of them because cyclotic statues are incredibly rare. Uh, in fact, even cyclotic statues that are in some of the mo world's most famous collections, like at the Getty Museum in California, a lot of the, um, the um, connections uh, of those statues and the way that those statues came into the collections have a bit of a questionable story. The provenance is a bit questionable with some of those, some of those um, statues, um, quite simply because um, there was so much looting going on, so much uh, archaeology that was being sold on the black market uh, that didn't have the, the most, uh, you know, up-to-date provenance, 
And so today, you know, museums, it's very important. They, they try to keep that provenance cataloged um, and that everything's coming from reputable sources. But nevertheless, there still are sometimes objects that are questionable in, um, in uh, museum collections th th these days. Uh, and so when it comes to psychotic figurines, just because of the rarity of them, um, historians are always, you know, trying to, to make sure and, you know, challenge um, that idea of the provenance. Um, so you can see here, right, why are these figures so popular, right, and highly collectible? Well, definitely because of the rarity. Um, and I would also say because of this, the simplicity uh, of the forms. Um, you know, with the male Lear player, this one you really see a beautiful relationship between the positive and the negative space of this sculpture in the round. Um, you can see the architecture of the Lear itself is sort of mimicked in the architectural shapes of the chair. Um, and there's just a really um, a lovely sense of repetition that, that goes on in this particular piece. Now this one is at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. Here's a photo of um, one that I took at the Getty Villa um, that's also of another Lear player. And these are some good examples from the Getty Museum um, of actually some of the varying types of shapes of the psychotic statues. Now, it is important to recognize that these statues actually um, would have been meant to have been um, laying down. You know, they were buried in, in graves. Um, they were not mounted on pedestals like this. The, this has to do with the museum display. They're displaying them on museum rods so that, you know, the public can actually see the details. But when they were found, they were actually found in caches laying horizontally on their backs. And of course, these psychotic statues are small scale, you know, relatively small, small scale, portable um, statues carved in the marble, of course, because marble is a prevalent material in ancient Greece. Now, when it comes to monumental statues, um, we see these beautiful uh, Kouros statues. Now, Kouros just refers to a male statue. Um, so this is a Kouros that was at, in the town of Apollonaeus um, in um, the island of, um, I believe it was Naxos, um, the island of Naxos where we traveled. And we were doing some archaeo trekking. Of course, that's the fun thing when you go to Greek islands is um, you, you literally can just, you know, jump on a scooter and have a map of the island and you can just sort of drive around the island and hike around the island and kind of hop around to the various beaches and you can go looking for um, these wonderful archaeological sites like this. So we, we tracked down this Kuro statue. Now this um, actually was never completed. You can actually see the statue is still attached to the bedrock in which it was being carved from. Um, we don't know why the, the ancient um, uh, psychotic people um, abandoned this statue, uh, but obviously they had some big plans underway there when they were working on it. Um, but yeah, this, uh, this was in and around the site that would have been dedicated to um, the god Apollo, as I was mentioning earlier. You can kind of see the Aegean Sea in the background over there. Okay, Minoan culture and art. Of course, we're going to look more at the mythology around um, Minoan culture and architecture. Now, of course, this is ancient Greece, so this is the land of myth. I mean, this is where we're going to see the Minotaur. This is where we're going to see, you know, um, centaurs. This is where we're going to see um, this idea of uh, heroes like Odysseus, right? And um, the, siren, the sirens of the sea and the Cyclops and, you know, uh, Pegasus. And, you know, this is, this is the land of, of myth, right? Um, and so these stories, right, that inform um, the uh, culture of what it meant to be Greek, to be Greek, right, uh, is just going to be very visually prevalent as we, you know, look at many of these works. Um, and of course, the element of nature. So the Greek people 
you know, it is said that they were basically like frogs living in a frog pond, right? Um, the sea was, and water was so much a part of their lives. Um, and they went between the water and the land, much like an amphibian, like a frog. So everything about the ocean and um, boats, sailing, you know, all of this was a part of their, their life. Um, and we're gonna look at lots of different mediums and methods uh, in their wall paintings, uh, with their fresco paintings in particular. Uh, we're gonna look a lot at Minoan pottery, which, if, you know, we're talking about ancient Greece here, the early developments with pottery are going to make lots of um, important you know foundational headway for us as we move into studying about the um, the greeks when we get to the next chapter um because they're going to start to advance all of that technology with vase painting so when we can kind of look at the earliest vase painting and the vase techniques then we really start to understand sort of the lineage right the history of that and um, we're definitely going to be looking at uh, the Bronze Age mythology and, um, right, Aegean archaeology, right, related to the mythological stories. So it's the Palace of Knossos on the island of Crete where we're going to be looking at a lot of Minoan art and architecture. Now, Crete is, you know, um, today, uh, one of the largest uh, islands um, that one would visit um, in the, the Aegean Sea and across the Sea of Crete. Um, and probably the most famous of all the archaeological sites there is the Palace of Knossos, in the city of Knossos. And the way that this palace was discovered actually uh, was discovered by a historian who was following he was following the stories of ancient Greece. He was reading the mythological stories. He was reading Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. And in the story, you know, it talks about King Minos and talks about the Minotaur. And the descriptions in the story and the legend of the story led him to various towns. And of course, he talked to all of the various townspeople. Um, and they were telling the stories that their ancestors had told them. And he eventually gets to the site um, where he believed the Palace of Knossos was and started digging. And lo and behold, by basically looking at the myth, he actually found fact, if this makes sense. So um, the Palace of Knossos, of course, architecturally is uh, really fascinating. If we look at the reconstruction drawing here, um, you can see that it has many layers. Um, they were using, um, you know, wonderful sense of clerestory lighting to, to actually light the interiors of the building. It had great um, circulation, um, uh, the venting with the air in it, um, of course, using natural, natural elements. Um, like transom windows and things like this. And, um, and of course they, they had uh, beautiful columns and they painted quite a bit of their architecture. And I was talking about um, uh, uh, Sir Arthur Evans, the archeologist who actually discovers Palace of Knossos. And of course he is the pioneer in the study of the Bronze Age in ancient Greece, ancient Aegean. And he also was one of the first archaeologists to define the Cretan scripts, both linear A and linear B. So he worked to um, crack those codes in order to interpret um, the, the uh, written record um, of the ancient Aegean uh, and also some of the early pictograph uh, writings. So he, um, he was definitely on a quest to, to learn about the ancient Aegean. So of course the Palace of Knossos is famous because it is believed to be the site of the story of the Minotaur. Now, when you have heard about the story of the Minotaur, you almost always learn about the labyrinth, right? And the labyrinth, it means the house of the double axe. And at the Palace of Knossos, there's a lot of axe or double axe imagery um, in uh, the murals and also in some of the um, uh, jewelry uh, of the time. Um, and so, you know, Arthur Evans was convinced, okay, this, this was the labyrinth in, in, the, in the myth, in the story. 
And of course, um, what happened? What, how did the Minotaur come to be? Well, the story goes that King Minos, um, he, he had, he had his, him and his wife, they had, they were given this beautiful um, Cretan bull, this beautiful white bull. And the uh, peoples would worship the bull and, um, you know, this was given to them by the gods. And they were supposed to sacrifice the bull, you know, in, in honor of the gods. Well, his, him and his wife, they fell in love with the bull. And they, they became somewhat arrogant in their... Um, worshiping of the gods. They basically had what was called hubris, arrogant pride, and they thought they could outdo the gods. They thought that they could basically trick the gods and keep the bull for themselves. And of course, you know, you can't trick the gods. They're going to get their revenge on you. And that's what happened. So they cast this spell on King Menos's wife, and she basically ends up having sex with the bull. And what ends up happening is she becomes impregnated with, of course, a baby. And it is a freak of nature. It is a minotaur. And, uh, and of course, like, you know, a freak of nature, the only way to um, satiate its, you know, cravings is going to be to feed it the blood of, you know, young children and virgin maidens, right? So when the minotaur is, is born, it's just this chaotic freak of nature. And the king hires this architect named Daedalus to build the labyrinth, um, basically to house the Minotaur at its core. And then so many times a year, they will like give it blood sacrifices to keep it at bay and to keep it from going crazy and taking over the town. So um, when you look at the layout of the Palace of Knossos, you actually realize hey, it actually kind of looks like a maze. It actually looks like a labyrinth. And of course, you know, at the, um, at the center, of course, we have a central court, we have a king's megaron, you know, and a queen's megaron, we have, you know, the throne room toward, toward the center um, to sort of protect, right, the king and the queen in case there is an attack from uh, outside enemies as well. And so, you know, the story of the Minotaur, the Minotaur is a half, half man, half bull creature, right? Um, body of man, head of a bull. And so, again, we have no, you know, fossil evidence of a minotaur, but we see them in sculpture, in wall painting, and in the stories, right, like Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, in the stories of ancient Greece. So it's as if the minotaur might as well have existed, you know. And again, Arthur Evans sort of takes it at face value and sort of believes in the myth strongly enough where he actually finds the site of the story at the Palace of Knossos. It's fascinating. I was talking about that Clara story lighting earlier. Here's a really good photo of it. Um, when we traveled to the Palace of Knossos, it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So they have done some recon you know, reconstruction there um, to give you a sense of like what it would have looked like. Um, this is a great example of the stairwell um, with um, you know, the lighting and good ventilation. You can see the columns um, are painted. And actually, they're not just uh, straight up and down. If you notice, the columns toward the top actually are more bulky. They're, they have a bulge in them. And that's what we call entasis, E-N-T-A-S-I-S, entasis. And this is something that we're gonna see later when we get to the classical Greeks, we're going to see that's what they actually really start to utilize this idea of entesis. Um, and this bulging, this swelling of a column actually makes the column look really strong, right? It's like it's like lifting or holding up the, um, the weight of the lintels and the architecture up above. And so it looks almost like a strong man who's sort of lifting a, um, you know, a, a bell bar, right, above his head. And it gives you a sense of movement in a way. And also, entesis, by having more curves to columns, it actually helps compensate for illusionary sacks. Because if you made all the lines perfectly straight, at a distance, they actually would be warping. They would, because of perspective, the lines would somewhat droop. And so even the earliest um, Aegean people, the earliest Greek people, 
realized architecturally they would have to compensate for this illusionary sag um, in order to make lines actually look perfect when in fact they actually are not straight but it's giving the illusion of them being perfect another really fascinating thing that i discovered when we were on the site um, is that they had plumbing and you know, plumbing is not a fancy, you know, uh, high-end thing that we normally talk about. But for the earliest civilization, they had um, lots of uh, uh, technology when it came to this. They actually had three separate water management systems, of course. Uh, one for the supply, one for the drainage of the runoff, and one for the drainage of the wastewater. So of course, it was just, the water is distributed at the palace by gravity that's feeding through terracotta pipes and um, to all the fountains and the spigots, you know, so bringing, you know, clean water to the people um, of Knossos. And that, you know, obviously is gonna make for a, a wonderful thriving city to have um, good clean water. Of course, the pipes were tapered at one end to make, you know, a pressure fit, and they used actual rope for sealing the pipes. So, again, not the most uh, fancy uh, thing to talk about plumbing, but, uh, definitely essential if you're wanting to have, you know, a really successful, um, uh, thriving population in a city. Um, and also that is an important thing to know that, um, of course, Greece is surrounded by salt seas. So having fresh water to drink is actually even today a challenge for Greek people. Um, the water being potable and, and able to drink is just still a challenge. They, they have to conserve water all the time. Um, you know, when we were there, water was, you know, definitely um, a luxury. Um, and um, so, you know, of course, it's the rainwater that they're, that they're collecting. Of course, then they're filtering, you know, water. But, um, but yeah, you, you don't want to be drinking salt water. So, um, and there's some more shots of the palace. Um, and this was a really great shot um, showing... The um, giant pithwai, or you know, pithwai is plural for the pithos or the, the pithos jar, and the pithos is just a storage jar, um, and it could store both wet and dry um, uh, consumables such as wine, oil, and grain. And of course, um, they were sunken in the ground, right, for easier access because people would come and gather, and you know, they could purchase, right, you know, grain or, or barter and trade, you know, grain and wine and so on at the city center. Um, so the Pithos has a wide mouth for, you know, for, for easy access. Some of the vessels have wavy lines on them indicating that there's a liquid in them. Others might have um, some symbols of, um, you know, grain or, or wheat on them. This is probably a lot of wine and water. Okay, wall paintings with the frescoes. Um, so definitely we're going to look at the subject matter and we definitely need to focus on the materials when it comes to fresco painting. And we do want to be able to compare it to the ancient Aegean uh, frescoes that we, um, ancient Aegean frescoes, comparing it to the ancient uh, Egyptian frescoes that we learned about last chapter and the kind of the varying differences when it comes to their technique as well. These are some photos that I took um, when we were you know, in the ancient Aegean, this is the Prince of the Lilies. And of course he has wearing this elaborate feathered headdress. And you can see he is sort of in a strict profile and then composite view. Um, but one thing we notice right away with the ancient Aegean frescoes is that there's a real sense of curvilinear flow. You know, there's, there's a lot more curves sort of going on here uh, with the body. Even in the negative space, um, you can see the, um, the lilies themselves, how we have some red lilies against a yellow or a light color background. And over here, it sort of is in reverse where we have a, a lighter color lily on the dark background. That is really important that we sort of notice that early on here in, in the early chapters of the ancient Aegean. Because when we get to the ancient, you know, classical Greek world, um, they will be using um, black figure vase painting, red and black figure vase painting, and bilingual vase painting where they're flipping the values like that with you know dark against light and light against dark compositions. 
Um, and so we're sort of noticing the earliest Greek people's affinity for design and understanding balance between positive and negative space like this. We see the earliest frescoes are incredibly colorful. Now, what, if, what is a fresco, right? So it's a painting, a mural painting on plaster, on plaster. So the wall has many different layers of plaster that are applied and on the final layer of plaster, that is the, um, the layer that receives the pigment. Now, in the ancient Aegean, they used a technique called wet fresco, or we call it wan fresco or true fresco. It is wet fresco, meaning that they actually work it piece by piece, so that, or section by section. So of course they have their overall design, but as the plaster is wet, then they are painting the pigment on. And what happens if anybody's ever worked with plaster, when the plaster is starting to dry or set up, it actually undergoes a chemical reaction. So if you touch it, it starts to feel hot to the touch. And what makes wet fresco, why we call it true fresco or guan fresco, the best fresco, is because when that chemical reaction is taking place, it creates a tighter and deeper bond with the pigment. The pigment basically gets absorbed into the plaster in deeper layers. Um, and so theoretically it is much more archival than fresco secco, which was dry fresco, which we saw in the ancient Egyptian world. Now, the ancient Egyptian, yeah, they used dry fresco. Yes, not theoretically as archival as wet fresco, but the ancient Aegeans were living in a dry climate. Their, their murals were, you know, in oftentimes tombs and hidden away from the elements. You know, the, the biggest threat to any painting is gonna be moisture, right? It's gonna be mold and water damage, right? So, um, so those dry frescoes of, of the ancient Egyptian world they were preserved really well just because of the climate they were in. But in the Greek world, this being wan fresco or wet fresco um, really preserves them. Now, there's another reason why these, um, these frescoes are preserved, and I'll, I'll tell you that in, in another second. But if we kind of get back to the content here uh, with the bull leaping fresco, this probably really captures that idea of Aegean um, curvilinear movement and that Aegean um, you know, love for life that we're seeing um, the best. And it's actually uh, showcasing um, the, an ancient ritual of bull leaping. Literally the acrobat is um, you know, running and he has sort of grabbed onto the, the horns of the bull and done a somersault you know, on the back of the bull. Um, and of course this would be quite the spectacle um, and, and you know, the ancient Aegean, um, you can see just the exaggerated, you know, curve of the arch of the back of the beast it is fascinating. Um, the border itself shows the real affinity for pattern. I mean, this looks so contemporary. I could see this on, you know, a tablecloth or, you know, um, some, some outfit or, or dress today in today's world. Very contemporary. Again, the colors are, are, um, uh, very rich and beautiful and we do see that they are using a lot of that blue pigment that's being imported so showing that the ancient Aegean uh, people already at this early phase are um, trading um, and making trade connections and uh, uh, business um, um, you know economical business plans um, for commerce with other uh, civilizations in places like the Middle East, Asia, and Africa. So, you know, they are travelers, the ancient Greek people. Um, and so, like we were saying, we were definitely comparing the idea of the ancient Aegean wet frescoes to the dry frescoes of ancient Egypt. Um, but you can also see some of the differences in the style. Um, although there are, you know, composite views in the ancient Aegean world, you know, and there's the kind of the fish eye on the side of the head with the figures, 
we see that um, oftentimes this um, style with more of the pinched waist, elongated curvilinear figures versus some of the more kind of, um, you know, strict um, posturing that we see in the ancient Egyptian world. Both civilizations still use architectural um, elements and as well as natural elements in their designs and they both use hierarchical scale in their designs. Looking at the king's throne room in uh, the palace of Knossos, um, you actually see again this beautiful sense of light on dark, dark on light, kind of switching, you know, um, giving simultaneous contrast in the scene. So um, some foliage sense of landscape, but we see more hybrid creatures here with a griffin, right? So half lion, half bird um, creature. This is one of the two gri griffins um, that's facing the throne room. See quite a bit of stylized detail there. And I loved this one. I, I got this shot um, in the queen's throne room or the queen's megaron um, of the dolphins, the pot of dolphins. Now um, it's dolphins and there's this other fish there and actually these are little sea urchins um little sea urchins and when you go to greece when you swim in the ocean um you'll oftentimes there will be sea urchins uh there and so you, you, know, you just don't step on them you just keep swimming um and you know some seaweed and other kinds of amazing um patterns the um in greece today of course we don't see lots of pods of dolphins coming through anymore because just the way the world is these days but the um in the ancient world i mean you you know there just would have been pods of dolphins right um an abundance of life in, in the ocean um and the uh, the wave pattern very popular um in the greek world we'll actually see that on um, some of their vases and things coming up the bull leaper, this is a little ivory figurine actually um, that was a part of a larger sort of montage. And it's a, it is a bull leaper, and of course there's a museum rod here um, sort of showcasing it. But in the ancient world, these more than likely uh, would have been sort of dangling on you know, chains and ropes uh, where they would be you know, meant to simulate that they were in the air jumping over the, this bull. Um, but I wanted to include it in the slide because it's an ivory figurine and you know in, Ivory comes from you know, typically elephants now you can get boar tusk ivory, but uh, We do see a lot of elephant ivory in ancient Greece. And of course elephants are only in Asia and Africa. They're not in Greece, right? They're not well, elephants weren't walking around on the island of Greece. So again, another perfect example of um, the fact that they were trading with um, other, you know, faraway civilizations. Um, the uh, bull Riton, of course, the Riton is an ancient um, uh, ritualistic drinking vessel. So, um, you know, you literally pour tons of wine in this and you, you know, basically it's a, it sort of reminds me of like a keg party or something. You pour all this wine in and then you're just sort of letting all this wine just go pouring in down your throat, you know. I would have been um, a part of obviously a, a, a ritual where people are going to be drinking lots of wine and, you know, um, getting, getting kind of wild and sort of worshiping Dionysus and so on. Um, so uh, you can see just sort of the detail that goes into something like that. Now, the rest of these images I've included, you know, from just my travel, so I'll kind of go through them quickly, but, um, you know, there were some clay models of the architecture of the Palace of Knossos. Um, so just the very idea that the architects had built a model, you know, of, of the structure right before they were going to build it, and that, that still remains today. And these uh, fans, plaques, which, you know, they're referred to as the town mosaics of the facades of various um, buildings um, in the, the town of, of Knossos. And so people could kind of decide, oh yeah, I want the front to look like this, or maybe I want this, you know. So it was kind of a, the artist, art, artist's way of sort of playing around with various design patterns for um, the fronts of buildings. 
more elephant tusk. Here's a boar's tusk helmet. Um, but we do know by the time we are, you know, getting to the, the ancient Aegean, we are starting to see more um, metal smithing going on. Of course, it's the Bronze Age, so we're starting to see more advanced technology sort of entering when it comes to the armor. Um, so we are seeing bronze armor for the body and still, you know, using a boar tusk helmet, right, um, to protect the skull. Okay, um, this relief amphora is definitely one of the treasures of ancient Greece. Um, it showcases scenes from the sack of Troy on it. Now, it is called a monumental pithos, so it's a large scale crater, basically it's a large scale vessel. And it was found in a funerary complex. And the, we're gonna look kind of more closely at the imagery um, here in just a second, but the story of the Trojan War is you know, in when we think of ancient Greece, it, it's the story that really is very romanticized. In fact, um, of course, the whole war itself was waged uh, because you may have heard of a, of a beautiful woman named Helen of Troy. Now, Helen of Troy, she actually was Helen of Sparta. She was married to the Spartan king. And he was sort of older and, you know, she, she was younger and he was this older guy. And what happens is the Greeks, um, there was a beauty contest with the goddesses, okay? And there were three goddesses involved. I, I believe it was um, Athena, who's, you know, tells Paris, Paris is going to be the judge of this contest because Zeus didn't want to get involved. And so Paris, this, you know, mortal who's a king, he's supposed to judge this beauty contest. And he says, well, you know, you guys got to give me something, you know, if, you know, you got to bribe the judge, right? Like any good beauty contest. So Athena says, well, if you pick me, then I will give you, you know, all this wisdom, you know, and, and, you know, victory right in the battlefields. And, you know, of course, then there's, you know, uh, Aphrodite and she, you know, Venus, Aphrodite, and she's like, if you pick me, I'm going to give you love, right? I'm going to give you the most beautiful mortal woman on earth. I'm going to give you Helen, right? Uh, and so, of course, uh, Paris is like, well, I want the beautiful woman. So he crowns Aphrodite as the most beautiful of all the goddesses, right? So he goes to Sparta to basically abduct Helen, Helen, and bring her back to Troy and across the Aegean Sea. And of course, by doing that, he creates a war. And this is what kickstarts that war. And then the Greek, you know, people along with the Mycenaeans, they, and the allies, they go, you know, get in their boats and they go to Troy to wage this war to get Helen back. Now, we all know that wasn't the full reason for a war. Most wars are economical, right? They're, it has something to do with money and power. But it's the romanticized story. So when the Greeks get there, when they get to Troy, of course, they have to get into the fortified city. Well, we all know how they do that. The Trojan horse, the ruse of the Trojan horse. So what they do is they create a gift, a wooden horse, and they hide, the army is hiding inside of the horse with all their weapons and everything. And they bring the horse to the gates of Troy and they say, oh, we're bringing you this gift and you know, you can uh, please receive this gift and open up your gates, right? And so they bring the, the horse in and at nightfall, all of the warriors sort of jump out of the horse and you can sort of see them hiding in the windows there. And they jump out and of course they, you know, rape, pillage and burn the whole town and they try to get Helen back for the king and all this stuff. 
So what's wild about this amphora is that um, it's in a, an open air museum, an archeological museum on, in the island of Naxos. And this museum has like no AC. It's like, you know, the, the air ventilation is just through like transom windows. And it's the one artifact in the museum that's totally, you know, sacred to them. So you can't take any photos of it, but they did let me take a photo of another uh, monumental crater in the other room, um, just so I could give you a sense of scale. So this is not the one that I was just showing you with the tro Trojan horse, but it, this is how large um, this vessel actually is. It's larger than a human being. It could basically fit inside of it. Um, yeah, the King's Game Board. These are all different art objects that I found on our travels there. Um, basically, this is a, a board to play a game with, you know, entertainment, kind of like a, a chess board or something like this. Um, the Festos disc, play disc with impressions um, on it, and they're like little pictogram symbols. And it's, it's actually unknown. The, the uh, images have not been de deciphered, so it's you know, an enigma. Minoan seals were important, um, you know, to, you know, part of that bureaucratic system, um, talk about ownership, right, or could talk about what was inside the sealed containers, um, and used for identifying. And then, of course, linear A and linear B script is going to be the writing from um, the, pre, you know, ancient um, Aegean peoples. Um, and this one it is just a piece that tells us information about the distribution of bovine, pig, and deer hides that were sold to a shoe and saddle maker. So kind of seems boring, but it's talking about um, basically trade, right, and commerce between um, people who sold various goods. Okay, yeah, of course, you know, we talked about Arthur Evans, um, you know, trying to interpret and crack the code with linear A and linear B um, script. Okay, oh, and the Minoan woman, this one. And of course they, they coined her the La Parisian, even though she's not a French woman, she's an Aegean woman. But they called her this because at the time it was found, the way French women dress, where they wore red lipstick and they had their hair in sort of a coffered bun with kind of wavy curls and sort of, you know, corseted, you know, waist with their bosoms kind of up in the air. So they were sort of referring her to that, but this is, this is an Aegean woman, right? This is how an ancient Aegean woman would have dressed and presented herself in the, in the ancient world. <laughs> Okay, the island of Thera, um, to, in today's world we call it Santorini. Um, it's probably known as being, you know, the, the world's biggest honeymoon destination. Um, and it's in the Cyclades. And in Santorini, there, uh, in the ancient island of Thera, there was a giant, you know, volcano. And at one time this whole island was completely solid. But the devastating eruption in the ancient world blew out the whole center of the island um, and completely destroyed, you know, the whole community and sent up a huge cloud of volcanic ash, which is called tephra. Now that tephra, you know, falls all over the island in, you know, six to 12 feet deep in some places completely burying these frescoes. Um, and so actually that volcanic ash preserved the frescoes over time so that later during the age of expeditions, when archeologists were uncovering the ancient site of Thera at Santorini, they found these beautiful color frescoes uh, underneath all that ash. Um, so it's completely preserved and then just like a time capsule, you know, in history. Now that same tephra has been found in far in far away places all throughout the Mediterranean, even. Um, so that that volcanic ash traveled, you know, the globe. Um, that's how big that eruption actually. It's actually it's one of the largest eruptions um, in in uh, since human time, you know, for the last forty thousand years almost as big as the eruption of Pompeii, which we're gonna learn about when we get to the Romans. 
Now, um, with the landscape with swallows or the spring fresco, you see the love for nature. You see the swallows, you see the, um, the foliage and the rocky outcropping, and it really looks like the wind is just blowing, that the sea breeze is kind of blowing up onto the rocky outcropping. And you just see the sense of color, right? They're using, you know, red and yellow ochre. They, you know, we've been seeing a lot of the lapis lazuli blue. Um, this one's from the House of the Ladies with the papyrus plants. The Blue Monkeys is probably some of the famous ones. Um, I put the, a really great video um, in your module uh, where they travel to some of the sites and, and um, the uh, historians talking about the Blue Monkeys and they, they showcase you know, the details up close. But what these monkeys are actually doing is they're gathering the, um, the saffron from inside of the crocus uh, uh, inside of the crocus plant and saffron is a um, very exotic spice that's oftentimes used in you know uh, asian and european and middle eastern cuisine um it's very fragrant and it's sort of like yellow it's sort of the color of turmeric um but oh it's so it smells so good and that's what they're doing. They're sort of collecting this. Now, monkeys don't really harvest saffron in real life. They're, they've sort of taken on the role of a human. You know, they're actually acting very human in these, in these images. Um, and uh, again, you can see the curvilinear aspects and the long sinewy tails and just really, again, very playful imagery in the Gian frescoes. Um, the Gian frescoes also showcase people from different parts of the world. So here is actually um, uh, depicting um, somebody from uh, the continent of Africa in this image. And you're seeing like a palm tree over here. Um, so they had a very cosmopolitan mentality. It was, uh, uh, they had a big world view. And I think that's really what makes the Greek people so fascinating. Of course, their boats, you know, so we get the sense of the, what their boats look like and how the dolphins are sort of jumping over their boats. Um, I love this one uh, because it actually has relief to it. So they are mounding up the plaster in certain areas to create a low relief sculpture plus the fresco. Uh, from the House of the Ladies, um, we see these women with, you know, big pantaloons and, um, you know, sort of bodices, but their breasts are actually just hanging out of their shirts, you know, so. And of course, she's got big hooped earrings on. There's rouge on her cheeks. I mean, she's sort of an entertainer of sorts here. Um, and she's obviously an important lady. Um, many of these ladies, right, lived in this house. They were more than likely probably ladies of the night. <laughs> okay, so let's talk more about the volcano. Um, so the Theron volcano has erupted nine times in history. And of course, the largest was in 1630 BCE. And that's what really destroyed the Minoan civilization on, on the island. When you go to Santorini today, or ancient Thera, you, um, nobody lives on the actual uh, caldera. The caldera is the actual volcano. They don't live on that part of the island. But the whole, the whole caldera, and actually the main, some of the beaches, are covered in um, black obsidian. Like a, it's volcanic glass, right? Uh, and so uh, when you're approaching the island, that's really all you, you see um, there. And you know, you'll, you'll walk the island and you'll, you'll check it out. You'll, you'll at least check out the caldera. Um, this is important with the image of the cruise liner because that's the caldera. And um, I took this photo from the, um, the mainland up on the cliff side from the city center and you can kind of see that in the in the map that the uh the whole inside was just totally blown out so those cliff sites are incredibly steep and even this area of water is incredibly deep um and you know it's just it's just fascinating geographically the location in fact on the island there's three different types of beaches there's um, Black Beach, called Kamari Beach, and it's the sand, because it's black obsidian volcanic glass, basically, 
it's so hot because it's black sand that you can't even walk on it without like approaching the water in your flip-flops. You, you literally have to take the flip-flops off right when you get to the water. That's how hot it is. Um, then there's Red Beach, Kokini Beach, and then there's White Beach, Aspiri Beach. And this all has to do with the various, you know, geographical interests because of that volcanic eruption. Um, so these are, you know, lots of different colors of stones that, you know, we were collecting when we were there on the beach. Minoan pottery. So let's talk about the materials and the predominant imagery. So of course, there's going to be a lot of sea and ocean like imagery, right? Um, fish and aquatic, you know, animals. Um, here we see the, um, the fisherman's net, you know, being sort of cast out. Um, and wavy lines, right, for water, and some of the, you know, the Greek key patterns that we see with the Greek wave pattern uh, over and over again on this one. Uh, and we're seeing kind of a wider, you know, wider sort of, sort of premier colors against a dark background. Here with the marine style octopus jar, um, we see, you know, a dark color imagery on a light color background. And this looks almost like a cartoon, like something from SpongeBob SquarePants or something. Very um, cartoon-like octopus. And the tentacles just create so much rhythm and movement throughout the uh, composition. And when, whenever I would always see this image in the textbooks, I always imagined that this vessel was completely um, circular, spherical in shape. Just imagine it as this big circular object. But it wasn't until I actually saw it at the Archaeological Museum in Heraklion that I was completely shocked. And of course, I, I wasn't allowed to take a photo. But um, from the side, it's, it's just super thin. So it's only wide from one angle, right, from the front and the back. But from the side, it's very thin, almost like a flask. And that's really probably what this was. You can see the opening is just the perfect shape for a mouth. And it probably had, you know, you know, water in it or something like this, right? Because if you were on the, on the ocean, right, traveling a great distance, um, you would need fresh, you know, rainwater, right, to, to drink. So that's probably, you know, what, what it really was used for. But take a look again at this octopus. And look at how in the negative space there's little sea urchins and little pieces of seaweed kind of floating around, just really filling in that negative space with beauty. These fish hooks kind of tell you a lot about how important fishing was. They're bronze. Um, this is a pair of fire dogs, so, you know, for cooking kebabs and things like this. Um, bronze scales um, for weighing, uh, so kind of showcasing, you know, for commerce and trade there. And I had to take this photo, include this in the slideshow of, you know, this was when we were there, when we walked through the city center, the seamen, um, the fishermen are uh, hanging all of the, the fresh produce of the day. And the octopus is, um, you know, of course, one of the, the staple uh, foods of, of the Greek world. And they put it on everything from pizzas to soups and salads and, these were some pink octopi, octopi hanging out um, there for people to uh, buy and to cook with. <laughs> it's a little olive trees in the background. Um, here's a hydrea that has the uh, fisherman, right, drawing the net and scooping the fish in uh, from the land. These were some shells that they found in ancient sarcophagus um, and so this person was buried and these were like shells they had collected in their lifetime and these shells were dated to being 3200 from 3200 bce so they're over 5,000 years old um and it just makes you think about you know when you see shells on a beach you know you wonder how old those really are um and also it just tells us a lot about the ancient peoples because just like how we would today collect beautiful shells on the beach that would remind you of your memories or your trips to the beach with friends and family. Um, that's, those were the same memories that these people were um, burying with their loved ones when they were passing away. And I just, I just thought that that was such a poignant moment. 
The snake goddess, okay. So um, your terminology on the worksheet, that uh, medium known as faience, um, faience is a glass-like opaque silicate. So it actually has um, this almost kind of glazy, I mean, there's different colors of faience, but it, it makes it almost look like it's an enamel or sort of has a glazed appearance to it. Um, of course, it's baked at a high temperature. And it creates just a really durable, you know, uh, surface on these uh, sculpted objects. And Snake Goddess, you can see, whoa, you know, her eyes are super intense. She's, you know, um, wielding two snakes in her hands and there's a feline sort of perched on her head. It's as if she is sort of getting control, right, over the animal world. She, it's as if she's a kind of a, a witch or, you know, maybe a, you know, a priestess, maybe a goddess, maybe she is um, superhuman, right? And what's fascinating is that, of course, this is the earliest of the Greek peoples, but we do know when we get to classical Greece, right, we know that, that the Greek civilization, they were polytheistic, they worshiped multiple gods and goddesses, but the Greeks envisioned their gods in human form very different from the ancient Egyptians whose gods were, you know, half, um, you know, half, half animal, half human, right? You know, they might have a falcon head and a human body in the case of Horus or a jackal head and a human body in the case of Anubis. Um, but the Greeks saw their gods in human form, um, but they just had kind of otherworldly, you know, uh, powers, right? Um, so when we see images, sometimes it's hard to know if they are a mortal or if they're a god or a goddess, right? Because it sort of looks just like a regular woman who just has maybe some, some extra powers, right? I mean, her breasts are sort of out of her bodice and she sort of looks like she's performing some sacred ritual here. Um, but this sort of poised stance that she's in makes us feel like she's something more than human, right? A goddess. Same thing here with the young God, question mark. Potentially, you know, we think it, he must be because of what he's made out of, right? Ivory, gold, and um, serpentine, and rock crystal. So uh, ivory and gold is like chryselephantine, you know, chrysos is gold, and elephant, right? Ivory, um, chryselephantine statues uh, were um, incredibly precious, right? I mean, you're using the most precious materials for, for this. Um, so he must have been some sort of cult statue, probably a god, maybe Apollo, but we don't, we don't, we can't say for sure on that one. The Harvester's Vase um, showcases the importance of the harvest season for the earliest Greek people in the ancient Aegean, and um, you can see they've harvested the grain and there's sort of a procession, you know, they're bringing the grain to town and the man has a rattle and they're singing, you know, they've been in the field working all day and they're singing. You can see their muscles. Um, it's real, there's really a liveliness there, um, showcasing, you know, the importance of the hearts. Okay, Mycenae. All right, so definitely we're gonna look mainly at the fortress of Mycenae. Um, and the Citadel of Tyrns here. Um, the Tyrns was first referenced by Homer in the ancient Greek world, who praised its massive walls that, that had a thickness of up to 20 feet in some places. And in ancient times, the city was linked to the myths around Hercules. They, they believed that this was his birthplace, this is where he came from. And so it has these sort of Herculean walls and, um, you know, it's uh, built with, you know, what the Greeks later referred to as Cyclopean masonry. So it has, um, you know, large stones that they thought only a cyclops could move, you know, because the cyclops is a giant and he can, he can move stones this big. Um, so it's a, a large fortified city and this, the citadel, um, because of the walls being so thick, the main gate with the approach ramp, the anybody, especially if you're an enemy and you're approaching, 
they they sort of force you to approach where your sides would be exposed so of course you know you your shield you would want to make sure to move it to the side so they're not going to shoot you in you know your left flank or something but um but that was kind of a strategy so that on the approach um the defenders of the citadel could shoot right arrows at the enemy and basically kill them even before they they were able to get through the walls. Now, of course, the walls were so thick that they felt protected, but still, um, the whole structure itself was very intimidating, um, the whole design or the layout of it. And of course, the king's megaron would be at the center because, you know, the idea of protecting the king was very important. Um, the interiors of um, these palaces also would be incredibly decorated with murals, uh, paintings right with frescoes and great examples is a detail of one of the Corbold galleries Corbold vaulted um, gallery showcasing the cyclopean uh, masonry these <laughs> large stones um, that are put in place um, and it's really just the weight of the stone that's holding it there um, really no mortar uh, in a way, it's like Ashlar masonry. It's just on a large scale. There's no mortar holding it together. It's just the weight. And, of course, the corbel vaulting is, you know, corbel arch is one of the ways um, to span the passage. Of course, we learned about post and lintel. Pretty simple. We're starting to see some more advances here with corbel um, uh, arching. And then, of course, later with the refinement of the actual arch. So the Citadel at Mycenae also uses Cyclopean masonry and Ashlar masonry um, for its massive walls. And, you know, the Mycenaean people were, you know, of course, very much protective, right, um, of, their, of their civilization. I mean, most of the, the men are wearing, you know, bronze, bronze armor. We see a fortified, you know, structure. Um, and probably the most famous um, entrance is the Lion Gate entrance. And I put a, a wonderful little video for you to watch in the module talking about the history behind the actual lion relief that is above the post and lintel. Um, and some of the meanings behind, right, the lines and the columns there. Um, but it's, it's an incredibly massive um, lower leaf sculpture. You can see the heads now are missing. Um, and then, of course, at, at Mycenae, there is what's referred to as the treasury of Atreus. Now, no, there's no longer treasures in this uh, Tholos um, shaped um, uh, treasury. But at one time, you can imagine, right, that there would, it would have been filled with uh, treasures of the ancient world. And when we look at it, we see a post and lintel and a relieving triangle there. But it's actually built into um, a mound of earth. Um, so that when you walk inside, you know, the structure, you see that it has a giant hemispherical um, dome. I mean, it's a Tholos tomb. Uh, it's a round tomb, but it has this giant hemispherical dome. And of course, this is a really great um, example of it for the plans and the sections. Um, but this becomes a really new way to uh, you know, vault, vault a ceiling um, in this kind of beehive structure. And at Mycenae, um, a lot of these excavations that take place um, are under the direction of the German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann. And um, he was somewhat of a controversial figure because although he had found, you know, found lots of famous you know, objects in his life, like most archaeologists, there was always this pressure you know, to, for him to make a discovery or to find you know, lots of gold. And he had, up until this point, developed a bit of a risky reputation for himself because he sometimes would salt the digs, meaning that he would sort of, well, he would basically lie and say, ooh, I found things here that weren't really here. He was sort of 
um, exaggerate things. And that was in his earlier years. So of course later he's, you know, trying to like, you know, clean up his reputation. And so everything that he did document at Mycenae, we know, you know, is, is from the finds because he did take great links to try to make sure his reputation wasn't stained um, because of the risk taking he did in his earlier years. But right, you know, people, People say yes today the estimates are correct, but it for the time right he had to kind of uh, you know work on his reputation. So probably uh, Grave Circle A is the is the site at Mycenae where he uncovers um, some of the more famous of the uh, golden artifacts. Um, and this one was the resting place of some of the uh, ruling families, and there were six grave shafts and nineteen bodies. Well, when he finds the funerary mask from Grave Circle A, he starts freaking out and he, he, he proclaims it to be the death mask of King Agamemnon, you know, from history. And actually, it's been, that has been pro proven false because King Agamemnon, um, the, the dates, um, the radiocarbon dating of this particular mask is not in alignment with the dates of King Agamemnon's reign. It's a few, a few hundred years off. But, um, but nevertheless, it's obviously a very prominent figure, you know, from Mycenae. And this is probably the one that gets the most attention, but you can actually uh, find lots of different examples from the period um, of, of masks in this way, uh, from actually from the same grave circle. Um, but this is the one in your text, so we can kind of focus on this the best. But actually you can see that it's um, beaten gold, so it's, it's hammered, or repoussé is, is what you would refer, refer to as a hammered relief. And it has been sort of beaten over probably a kind of a mold to create the shape. And you can see details have been put in with the beard and the mustache and the, and the eyebrows. And his eyes are closed. Um, and of course, this is a death mask, so it would have been placed over the, the physical remains, right, of the human. Now, this is from 1600, roughly BCE. If we compare that to the funerary, you know, death mask of King Tut uh, from uh, 1323 BCE, we can see that the Egyptians, although just, you know, 200 years later, you can see the difference, right, in the technology, but it's something to remember that the, but by the time the ancient Egyptians make the death mask of King Tut, they had been, um, you know, making death masks for a thousand years. Um, they had more time, basically, to perfect their technology, um, whereas the death mask from Mycenae, it's one of the first examples that we see um, in the ancient, you know, uh, Aegean of metal smithing on, you know, something like as elaborate as this death mask. So, you know, it's something to, to recognize how much extra time the Egyptians did have to develop their skill and their craft. But nevertheless, um, other things that might be different if you're comparing and contrasting them, we mentioned that the death mask from Mycenae, the eyes are closed, and with King Tut, the eyes are open, right? That's that eternal wakefulness, right? Because the Egyptians lived to die. They, they believed that they still lived in their afterlife. Um, so they're, they're reborn again. This is not King Tut dying. This is King Tut being born again, right? Um, the other thing is, remember, the ancient Egyptians, um, idealized images of their leaders. So, I mean, we do know King Tut was a boy king, but still, all the images are sort of idealized. Here, this is, this is depicting the man older, right? He has a mustache, he has a beard, he has hair, he has a furrowed brow. You know, he, we can kind of see his sense of his age on his face. Um, and so, very different. Um, uh, in that sense. So there's lots of other things that you could say to compare and contrast there, but that's just a few. Uh, other objects that are found in Grave Circle A include this beautiful dagger blade 
and um, on one side of it, it has um, a lion hunt. It has images here of a lion hunt, and it has you know, it's a bronze dagger with inlays of gold, silver, and yellow. Yellow is this uh, black color here. And so lots of details uh, when it comes to the embellishments here and actually, you know, representative of how, um, how skilled, right, these, these early peoples were when it came to metalsmithing. Other good examples here, some more bull's heads and the golden diadem, steel with chariot, female head, two goddesses um, with a small child. So again, we can kind of see there are sort of more than just, than just mortal, right? Um, we kind of get this sense that because of the way that they are dressed and um, you know the location in which they're found, because they're made out of rare ivory, so very you know in some ways ivory was more costly than gold. Perhaps you know the statue would represent deities that would parallel to later Greek Greek um, gods and goddesses. Um, but again, it's still somewhat of an enigma. And the warrior bases uh, from Mycenae depicting the um, outfits um, that the soldiers uh, would be sort of dressed in for battle, right? Their helmets, um, you can see their, um, their, sh their shields, their spears, even their um, shin, shin guards on their, on their legs there. And they're all really, you know, depicted in the same way, right? They're functioning as sort of one unit. There is a sense of rigidity, rigidity and order there. And if you compare that to the harvester base, it's very different, right? Harvester base is, is uh, carved, you know, out of stone. It's a relief carving. Warrior base is painted. This has lots of overlap and a sense of, you know, uh, movement and kind of wind blowing through the, um, the, um, the grain uh, from the Minoan world in the Mycenaean is much more, again, sort of focused on the warrior. There's kind of a rigidity. Um, just kind of gives you, the, shows you the difference maybe in these two societies, um, the way in which the human figures are, are depicted, right? So guys, something to think about here, some, some questions which, you know, we can kind of go over when we zoom next talk about some of, you know, uh, more of the possible functions of the psychotic sculptures, comparing, you know, Egyptian um, art to the art of the Aegean world, right? Especially when it comes to the wall paintings. Um, maybe talking a little bit about the, the belief systems and the idea of the afterlife and how they um, dealt with preparing bodies and the funerary art of the time. Um, Minoan civilization declining. We can kind of talk about some reasons for that. Of course, we know the eruption of the uh, vol volcano is going to play a part in that, but there, there could be others. Um, and of course, we'll continue to compare their art and architecture and culture between Minoan and Mycenaean people. Um, it is important to realize that really by the end of this chapter, the settlements at, like the Minoan culture is sort of, you know, been sort of wiped out. The Mycenaeans actually um, will abandon their their fortresses as well and we actually end up going into somewhat of a dark period of the dark ages of Greece as it's called but by the next chapter we'll start to see um, kind of a re-emergence and then kind of a rebirth into the golden age of Greece as we call it with classical Greece um, so it is kind of this chapter is important because you sort of see little glimmers and then things are sort of dying down going into the dark ages and then we're going to kind of resurrect ourselves with the golden age of Greece next, it, you know, next chapter um, when we get there. But um, yeah, so it's been a great, a great talk here and just make sure to check out the videos from the Ancient Aegean module and I look forward to seeing you guys again soon and um, continuing on learning more about um, the Greek people in the next chapter. Thanks. Bye-bye.